Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, whichever time zone it is uh, for you at the time. Uh, thank you very much for USEC for inviting me to talk. Uh, my name is John Dancona. I am uh, one of the heads, uh, head of research in container ships at How Robinson Partners. Uh, we're quite an old ship brokerage. Um, and just to give you an idea of our company structure, we are a ship broking company, uh, privately owned uh, since 1883. We cover uh, key markets in shipping of dry cargo, tankers, containers, LNG. Within that, we also deal with the sale and purchase of ships as well and new build. Uh, and also there's a group there called Research, which is where I am. Just so that you know, in my past, for the past five or six years, I've actually been living out in Asia and just moved back to the UK here anyway. Uh, now, the next slide, just to give you an idea, we do have offices all over the world, just gives you an idea of how large we are as a broken firm. However, let's crack on with this. Now, what we're going to talk about today is the container market, the market for containers. Now, my speciality, I must confess, is actually more to do with the ships. Um, remembering in the container market, uh, we have the ships that carry the boxes, but then you have a separate market, the freight market for the boxes themselves, which I think many of you in the audience will be far more interested or uh, involved in. So I'm going to swerve a little bit away from my own expertise uh, and to try and give you a simplified view of how we currently see the situation. Now, to ask anyone for a situation at the moment uh, is almost rather ridiculous because no one quite knows what's going on. No more so than in this sort of market situation with containers uh, where we are part of the global supply chain. And once that global supply chain is affected in any of the chinks of that chain, lots of things start to go wrong. So, the way I sort of see this very simplified uh, view, and do excuse me, this is a simplified view, um, there are more sort of detailed elements which go into a freight rate, but roughly speaking, I've separated it into four key areas, okay? One thing you need is ships, okay, to carry these boxes. Second one is cargo, uh, of which, bearing in mind that in agriculture as well, is only just still a small portion of the overall global trade that gets put in boxes and sent around the world as well. So we've got the cargo there and the competition to get that space on the ships. We've also got fuel costs as well, the cost of actually running those ships, which people like liner companies and those sort of uh, uh, carriers effectively pay for or have to cover that cost of fuel. And then finally, we've got services. So these are what liner companies will set up and provide a nice little what they call a loop of trade from certain ports to take boxes from there to there. Put all that together and you should have your freight rate. Now, the current situation is we've got rather a lot of ships, many of them doing nothing. Cargo at the moment has pretty much disappeared because of the lockdown. Fuel prices are ridiculously cheap. Now, I've left a question mark on services there and also a question mark on freight. So this is what we're going to try and understand. But let's have a look at the first three parts uh, to start with. Now, ships, we have too many of them. Uh, key trends in our development of what's happened on the container market is uh, effectively we've built more and more bigger and bigger ships okay and at the moment the earnings for those ships which have never been particularly brilliant in the past 10 years were starting to recover and then have plummeted again as COVID-19 hits as well you'll see some of these slides later so I don't want to go into some of the detail but these are the numbers of ships broken out in terms of capacity so the size of the ships how many TEU 20 Foot equivalent units they can take. Uh, effectively, these are uh, the amount of boxes. Now, at the top of that table, you've got the smaller ships carrying just under a thousand TEU or a thousand of these 20 foot boxes. Uh, and then moving up the scale until you get the biggest ones, over 18,000 uh, TEU per ship. Larger ship at the moment is just under 24,000 TEU. 
gives you a number, an idea, but the chart on the right effectively tells a very simple tale. Containerization, this idea of building ships that can just carry these uh, boxes around the world, which you can put all sorts of cargo in, effectively has seen this huge growth rate. But the colors there tell a different story. They're building less of the smaller ships and more and more bigger ships. It doesn't always match up with the trade growth, though. Often in trade, we're requiring all sorts of different types of ships. And certainly some of the smaller ones and midsize are being a bit forgotten about uh, as liner companies focus on bigging, building the biggest ships uh, to try and get economies of scale, but not always managing it. On the left hand side, you've got a markings there which says charter market ships. And that broadly goes up from the smallest ships up to about 10,000 TEU. Above that, the larger ships tend to be on the long term contracts, so they don't really appear on our charter market for hiring ships as well. Now, our charter market, our Hal Robinson Container Ship Index, we've been tracking the charter market since 1997. Um, and as you can see, broadly based on this index, we, we, we uh, assess about 18 different types of ships as well each week. Uh, but broadly speaking, for the last 10 years, as a ship owner, you're not really earning that much. And it's been a very, very tough time for the container market in general. Just as things were getting better last year, suddenly the market takes another hit with the COVID-19 coming through. You can see it in some ways, the actual uh, um on the left-hand chart, you can see a year-on-year -year representation of our index, that red line showing what's happened so far this year and suddenly taking a dive below those levels of previous years. The simple reason is, is on the right-hand chart where you've got the index in red, but actually those blue lines show the numbers of ships sitting spot waiting to find employment which had been getting lower as we progressed through last year, but suddenly has risen to over 200 ships sitting idle without anything to do. So that situation largely has meant that our rates are just absolutely crashing as there's not enough employment for our ships. Now, why? Well, trade has been cut, mainly because most of the countries, both importers and first of all exporters, were put into lockdown as well. Now, I've put something here. Vessel demand disappears as end users are forced into lockdown. I want to be very clear on this. This is not demand people not wanting goods. This is demand where people have to shut up shop, shut up businesses and literally try and protect themselves from this virus as well. Very different. Anyway, the trade cuts, just to give you an idea on how we look at trade, we look at the head haul trade, which is the main key trades that determine whether a liner company decides to put in a service of you know, ships to do a regular uh, service calling at various ports. We group it into four different uh, tiers. Tier one is the big trade from Asia into Europe. Tier two is other east-west trade, which includes trade going into the US the biggest importers as well. North-South tends to be, uh, you know, from Northern Hemisphere to Southern Hemisphere trades, and then a lot of regional trade, of which inter-Asia trade really takes up a vast majority of this portion. Now, our trade growth in uh, containers had been growing a good 3 to 4% per year. But suddenly, uh, last year, things started slowing up. And then this year, we're already down at least by 2%. Um, and things could get much worse as well. If you look on the left-hand chart, this shows the seasonality. So it shows monthly uh, trade of that total head haul volumes. And where we are with our current statistics up until March, we're already down on trade at least over 2%, and it could get even worse. The next couple of months, we know April, May will be awful in terms of volumes of trade movement. Um, so this is still to come, um, or we've actually been living through it, while the import countries suddenly were in lockdown.
However, in some ways, that explains why ship owners uh, uh, were, have very weak earnings at the moment. We, the trade has been taken away. Our shipping industry was largely sort of focusing itself on this the beginning of this year on the new changes to fuel regulations, whereby uh, shippers or, or ships would need to burn much lower uh, sulfur content fuel oil. Um, going forward. So the focus was on that. And then the virus came up and no one quite saw the fact that oil prices would crash rather spectacularly. The chart on the left gives you an idea on what we were working to on a longer term basis of reducing the sulfur content. You can see the red line there going from 3.5% sulfur content within bunker fuel, which is the fuel for ships, falling down to 0.5%, which would be the new regulation. That would come at a cost, basically mean that we would need to burn uh, a much cleaner fuel, which would cost more. However, no one saw on the right hand side of the dramatic crash that we've seen in oil prices, which I'm sure other people will cover as well. But basically, our cost of fuel is pretty volatile anyway. This gives you an idea that the main sources or types of fuel that we were running were more the blue variety, which was higher sulfur fuel oil, heavier fuel oil, rather than much cleaner gas oil, which, as you can see, the price is far higher. People were expecting the new regulations to have the prices really go up. However, as you can see, the price is absolutely crashed and currently we're in a situation with incredibly cheap oil prices. They are expected to improve uh, gradually as we uh, sort of push through the year. But at the moment, there's also a lot of oil left in storage as well. So we go back to our little matrix. We've got lots and lots of ships uh, with nothing to do. Our cargo has disappeared. So people needing to find space on ships, there should be plenty. Fuel is really cheap as well. So how come we've got freight rates still holding steady? Now, one of the reasons is, is I'm keeping that bl uh, question mark under services, which we'll explain. But freight rates in general, okay, the cost for the boxes, are holding up quite firm. Now, here we need to understand that we're talking about head full freight rates, which is not quite what you would be using in this audience. On the left you, and right, you've got two key indicators that the industry uses, the Shanghai Freight Index, which is basically tracking uh, the value of boxes moving out of the main export hub in the Far East. And then also you've got the new Freightos Baltic uh, uh, Global Container Index, which does uh, several different trades and also covers the backhaul routes, which we'll go into in a sec. But broadly, speaking, freight rates are still holding up quite firm year on year, uh, which is quite surprising, really, if you consider that really there's a huge amount of spare space on ships um, and you would expect the freight rates to crash. Uh, if we actually turn over to the freight rates you might be more interested in, it's backhaul rates. Now, these come from uh, um, the Freightos Baltic Exchange. And here I've just taken some of the U.S. West Coast to the back to Far East Asia and South Asia, and also the U.S. East Coast back to Asia as well. And as you can see, actually, freight rates are much cheaper, but they tend to often follow a seasonal pattern. If you can see in the right hand chart, East Coast freight rates uh, really in the first uh, weeks of this year reached very high levels for people wanting to export out of the US back into Asia. Now, some of this was coming on the back of the end of last year. Trade going into the US really started to slow up a little bit towards the second half of the year. What that means is that boxes full from Asia go over into the US and then you don't really, you actually get a slowdown in the amount of those shipments delivering boxes into the US. You move into the New Year period, suddenly we get hit with Chinese New Year as well and then the virus, but then people are needing to try and find boxes in which to put their grain exports or agriculture exports back into Asia as well. And that caused a huge uh, uh, tightness in capacity. There weren't enough boxes really sort of coming uh, 
forward. That was partly because of that slowdown in the head haul exports going into the US beforehand as well. Um, these uh, rates will just cover a, a dry box. If you're wanting a refrigerated cargo, you could be adding at least another sort of double the amount at current freight rate levels. And again, this virus has meant that boxes have got stuck and not been where they needed to be for the whole efficient supply chain to keep working. So therefore, we have had this uh, tightness at times in people needing to find boxes pushing up freight rates. But then things have come back down again. Um, but at the moment, freight rates on the uh, backhaul routes, so from the US back into Asia, are actually relatively cheap at the moment. That backhaul, front haul trade, or head haul as we call it, the head haul is the main trade which liners would develop their, their business for. And then on the way back, they would pick up whatever they could at a much cheaper price. You can see the differences in global head haul trade in the blue against the back haul trade. Again, in the red, you can see much smaller. OK, then on the right, I've sort of focused it a little more on the Asia and North American trade as well. So key that determines it is that head haul route anyway. But why did freight rates still get supported when we've got a lot of ships uh, and should be plenty of spare space? The difference is services. Now, the amount of services suddenly have been cancelled or blanked. Uh, frantically to deal with this sudden lockdown measures. Okay. Um, and this is where you've removed capacity from the key uh, uh, head haul container routes. Okay. You can see the amount of sort of capacity in TEU on the left hand side, and then a forward view going out to July on the numbers of blank sailings. So suddenly, what this means is, is that a service that you should be expecting one sailing a week, suddenly they drop a week. And then you, potentially as users of freight, this is a bit of a struggle. Now, the key thing is, is that that is not necessarily a very good service, but it's necessary now because liner companies really could go bankrupt if those freight rates were to have crashed so much. So they have managed to cut capacity hugely, very, very quickly, in order to try and keep themselves uh, liquid and afloat. Uh, this gives you an idea in terms of some of your options uh, and the way that they've managed to, the liner companies have grouped together into these alliances uh, to help try and protect that capacity and therefore help the freight rates on the trade. I need to move very quickly to the final slide. What do we think is going to happen in the future? Who knows? Am I being uh, uh, flippant here? Well, if the likes of China uh, have to cancel their forecasts and the likes of numerous massive companies have to also ca uh, cancel their outlook for this year, then I think I'm in perfectly decent company to wonder really what is going to happen. Let's go back to our matrix. What do I expect? Well, ships, actually the amount of spot ships should fall once the cargo starts to return, once people emerge from lockdown. Same thing with cargo and the enforced cuts. I do expect demand to come back. Fuel prices are cheap now, but to be honest, this is really way too low to uh, for even the oil industry to really manage going forward. But there's a lot stored. But in general, we would expect fuel prices to rise. Services, as I said, they've managed to cut capacity by very quickly blanking sailings. But really, the essence of the whole container market is about regular, reliable services. I wonder. I think that the liner companies may just need to start getting back some of their volume and they may not be able to get away with cutting the regularity of services when, uh, you know, just to hold and preserve their freight rates while end users are struggling to get their goods delivered on time and regularly uh, to try and help their industries getting back. I see the regularity of liner services uh, and reliability has been fundamental for the world economy to get back on its feet. That's how important this whole thing is. So at the moment, it's understandable to cut the services. But going forward, when countries emerge, who knows?
So the freight rate, could it actually slightly come down a bit as maybe some of these liner companies who are really sort of bleeding cash, a lot of them, uh, maybe need to struggle to get back the volume over value? To be honest, who knows? But this is certainly extraordinary time for the container market. Uh, and it's difficult for users of freight to, to get used to this. Uh, but this is a temporary blip that is going on. And as things get back, then the building up of these regular services, I think, will be there for users of freight. And at that point, I think we'll have plenty of ships to carry people's cargoes going forward. But it certainly is an extraordinary time. Thank you very much for your attention, and uh, I hope you all stay safe and well. Thank you.